Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Faisal Khan. I'm the neurologist uh, who started uh, Houston Medical Clerkship. Welcome, everybody, for today's uh, uh, grand round presented by Dr. Waji Ansari. Uh, brief introduction of Dr. Ansari. He is a graduate from uh, Bakai Medical University from Karachi, Pakistan, aspiring to become a future neurologist uh, going for the residency for this year. And uh, we are hoping good things from him. And his topic will be acute brainstem syndrome and acute diencephalic syndrome. Hope you all enjoy it. Thank you. Dr. Ansari. Thank you, Dr. Khan. So uh, I'll start off with uh, today my presentation is about acute brainstem syndrome and acute diencephalic syndrome. Um, so first, let's uh, talk about the definition of acute brainstem syndrome. Um, Acute Brainstem Syndrome is defined as an uh, inflammation or an autoimmune reaction against the brainstem, primarily involving the medulla. And uh, it could occur individually, alone, as its own disease. It could be related to multiple sclerosis. It could be related to NMOD, a neuromyelitis and optical spectrum disorder. Or uh, it could occur individually. Uh, so acute Brainstem Syndrome is commonly seen in patients with NMOSD. Uh, brainstem, as we all know, we have the midbrain pons and medulla. These are the primary structures which would be involved in this condition, but uh, data suggests that medulla is actually uh, the main organ or, th or the part of the brain that is involved in this condition. So uh, explaining acute brainstem syndrome without NMOSD, I'm not going to go forward with that. So first I will explain what NMOSD is. Why? Because acute brainstem syndrome is more commonly found in this disease. Now going forward. So, uh, neuromyelitis optical spectrum disorder is actually a rare demyelinating inflammation and antibody-mediated disease, which primarily affects the optic nerve, uh, the brainstem, and the spinal cord. Um, it is associated with autoantibodies against the aquaporin-4 uh, that is present in the astrocyte portion of cells. Um, now, let's talk about what aquaporin-4 is. So, aquaporin-4 is actually uh, a channel that controls the homeostasis of water in the body. We have aquaporin, aquaporin channels in our kidneys, we have aquaporin channels in our heart, our lungs, our intestine, everywhere. But this channel specifically, aquaporin 4, is actually present in our brain. Now, this controls the regulation of water, the homeostasis of water, and autoantibodies against this channel produces NMOSD. Now, NMOSD has the main symptom of NMOSD is optic neuritis and acute myelitis. Myelitis means inflammation of the spinal cord. And, but it's not limited over here. It also has something called the area posthumous syndrome, the acute brainstem syndrome, like I mentioned earlier, acute cerebral syndrome, acute diencephalic syndrome. Uh, acute brainstem syndrome and acute diencephalic syndrome will be the target of my presentation today. So going forward. Uh, acute brainstem syndrome, just like I mentioned earlier, are antibodies against the brainstem that could produce symptoms of diplopia or double vision, intractable hiccups, dysphagia, vertigo, facial paralysis, quadriplegia, ataxia, ilalia, dysarthria, and nausea and vomiting. Um, ilalia, I am not sure like everybody knows about what ilalia is, but ilalia is actually a difficulty in producing or developing of speech. Okay. We okay. Why the nausea and vomiting? Because APS is also associated with the area posthumous syndrome. Uh, let's let's talk about area posthumous. What area posthumous is? Area posthuma is a um, is an area of the brain which is not protected by the blood brain barrier. Autoantibodies against that can produce symptoms of nausea and vomiting. Why? Because the vomiting center is over there. And so going forward with it. So. This is actually an MRI of the brain of uh, patient with acute brainstem syndrome. Over here we can see the Mickey Mouse shaped structure, the midbrain. We see hyperintensities over here, as you can see. This is actually a uh, pulled up from a patient who had ABS symptoms and later on developed NMOSD. So these are the hyperintensities that were found in the patient who was pursuing symptoms of ataxia. Uh, this artria, dysphagia. Do you have any questions so far? No. No. Good. Okay. More lesions seen over here. 
between between hyper densities, hyper intensities over here we have a medulla involvement, medullary involvement over here. Now, um, yeah. So now talking about the acute diencephalic syndrome. So acute diencephalic syndrome uh, is diencephalic is actually a structure of the human brain uh, that has the hypothalamus and the thalamus. And the uh, hypothalamus and the thalamus are actually uh, an area which are high in these channels, the apoporin four uh, protein. Autoantibodies against these structures can produce the pathology mm -hmm. or the sin signs and symptoms that are seen in acute diencephalic syndrome. Um, the symptoms of acute diencephalic syndr uh, syndrome may include, okay, so first look at the picture over here. We have hyperintensities of the hypothalamus seen in this picture. Uh, this patient had acute diencephalic syndrome plus acute brain stem syndrome too. So what we see over here is hyperintensities of the hypothalamus and the periventricular gray matter. Okay, the symptoms of ADS. So symptoms of ADS, as we all know that hypothalamus and the thalamus is actually a uh, controller, I would say, or uh, that it controls the sympathetic activity of the human, uh, of our body. It controls our temperature, it controls our blood pressure, it controls our heart rate, it controls our ionic balance. So any disruption of those mechanisms due to an autoantibody reaction or inflammatory reaction can produce these symptoms, which include hypothermia, hypotension, bradycardia, hyponatremia, and symptomatic narcolepsy. Now, we can understand why hypothermia occurs. Why? Because hypothalamus controls it. We know why hypertension occurs. Hypothalamus controls it. Bradycardia, heart rate, hypothalamus controls it. But what about the hyponatremia and symptomatic narcolepsy? Can we even explain why we have some symptomatic narcolepsy and hyponatremia? So hyponatremia is actually occurring because of a, because of a disease called SIADH. Why? Because the hypothalamic area and the hypothalamus pituitary axis, we have uh, nucleus, a nucleus over there that releases ADH. Any antibody against that, we have SIADH, and we know a uh, good amount of uh, ADH in the body leads to symptoms of hypervolemia leading to hyponatremia. What about narcolepsy? Why symptomatic narcolepsy? Symptomatic narcolepsy is actually a phenomenon seen in this condition. Why? Because um, we have hypocretin and oryx and high volumes of these structures over there in the in the diencephalon. So autoantibodies against those areas, symptomatic narcolepsy, and we all know that narcolepsy has decreased the amount of hypocretin and oryx in, in the body. Now, diagnostic criteria for NMOSC, this was actually put from uh, the Houston Medical Church website. It's available over there. I can also provide the link at the end of the uh, at the end of the presentation. Now, NMOSD, just like I said, is a spectrum disorder, primarily involving the optic neuritis, primarily involving your optic nerve, your spinal cord, but not limited to, and also including area for streamer syndrome, acute brain syndrome, diencephalic syndrome, and the cerebral syndrome. So in order to diagnose NMOSD, we have two possibilities. We can have a seronegative case, and we have a seropositive case. For a seropositive case, one of the conditions should be optic neuritis, transverse myelitis, or area for streamer syndrome. Now, over here, I've written optic neuritis, transverse myelitis, or area for streamer syndrome, but there is this thing called longitudinal extensive transverse myelitis. Now, what does this mean? It means that the lesion of the spinal cord will involve three continuous structures, or in uh, making it more easy, three continuous virtual involvement of the related to the spinal cord, okay? That's the LETM. Now, what if it's apoporin 2 IgG negative? It would include two core clinical characteristics. The clinical char characteristics that I mentioned earlier would be APS, uh, transverse myelitis, or optic neuritis, and exclusion of altern alternative diagnosis. Now, statistics for NMOSD. Um, let's say, I said it earlier, that optic neuritis and transverse myelitis will be the initial presenting complaint of NMOSD. But what about ABS? Can an ABS be a presenting complaint of NMOSD? Yes, it could. In about 70% of the patients that had NMOSD or later on developed NMOSD, they had acute brain cell syndrome. And they were also anti-PC4 positive. Um, 
And uh, the area of posthumous syndrome is actually more commonly found with anti-CQ4 antibodies compared to the patients who were negative for these antibodies. Uh, it is also found that the NMOSC is associated with other autoimmune conditions like Myasthenia gravis, uh, SLE, or antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Prevalence of NMOSC, just like I said, is a rare disease area. It's only found in five of, of every 100,000 cases. Um, demographic, female population is more affected in a ratio of nine is to one. For every nine women, one male will be affected. Um, NMOSD is not, rated, uh, not limited to the adult population. It can also be uh, presented in a, um, in a child, pediatric population too. Um, FDA, FDA approved drugs include enculizumab, a monoclonal antibody, enabulizumab, rituximab, tocilizumab, azithiopine, mycopenadine, and cefalizumab. Uh, mechanism of action of these drugs is believed to, this uh, enculizumab is a CD19 inhibitor, Enabuzumab is a CD20 inhibitor. Um, rituximab decreases your B cell production. Uh, Tocilizumab is similar to what rituximab is, but it is not clearly understood. Uh, as a therapy and mycophenolate, uh, they decrease DNA or purine or pyrimidine synthesis. And ceftriximab uh, de decreases the complement, uh, the, the membrane of the complex that is involved in the development of disease. So, how? Okay, so we need to understand that NMOSD is different from multiple sclerosis, but there are a lot of features that are similar to each other. Now, well, how would an NMOSD be different from multiple sclerosis? So, the optic derived is just like I said, the primary presenting complaint of NMOSD is severe in NMOSD compared to MS. Um, the optic advantage we have in MS has a good recovery rate compared to NMOSD. It has only a 40% of recovery rate after treatment. Um, therapies for MS, be it uh, interferon, for example, can worsen the cases of NMOSD. Um, transverse myelitis in NMOSD is more expensive. Please keep this point in mind, as I'll explain it earlier, and lesions are more extensive in MOSD compared to the ones uh, seen in MS. So moving on further, I have a few images to compare NMOSD and MS. This is a case of NMOSD, and this is a case of MS. The results are pretty much apparent over here, as clearly visible, optic nerve involvement, bilateral versus unilateral. Lesions are more extensive compared to lesions are less extensive in MS. This was actually put, uh, pulled up from a uh, data on PubMed, and uh, this actually explains it in a very comprehensive manner. So over here, extensive lesion, bilateral, MS, less extensive lesion, unilateral. Going further, just like I said earlier, okay, yeah. So just like I said earlier, the lesions in transverse myelitis are extensive, and the term NETM, Right, longitudinal extensive transverse myelitis. It means over here, look at the lesions of the spinal cord in the patient with MS. Lesions are not too extensive. Okay, you see spots of hyperintensities in the spinal cord. What you see over here, lesions involving one, two, three, or more, greater than three, equal to three, or greater than three vertebrae, consecutive, or in parallel to the spinal cord. That's what you see in transverse myelitis. So, like I explained earlier, transverse myelitis, severe. Transverse myelitis oh, in uh, NMOSD is more extensive and uh, compared to your MS, which is seen in spots over here. Uh, any further questions for this? No. No. Okay. So, uh, do you have any questions about uh, the, the demographics or treatments? No? So, 